Welcome to the next building block for B-cell cancer care, exploring personalized treatment with emergent BTK inhibitor options in CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. I'm Dr. Anthony Mato from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Nirav Shah from the Medical College of Wisconsin. I'd like to thank Medical Learning Institute and Peerview for providing this session and Lilly Oncology for providing the educational grant for this webcast. We'll be asking you a number of questions throughout this activity. You may want to keep track of your responses. Also, we've prepared some practice aids that we will be highlighting during our discussion. You'll want to refer to them throughout, so please take a moment to download these tools before we get started. Finally, please ask us any questions in the space provided and we'll try to answer them during the Q&A segment. These are my disclosures. These are Dr. Shaw's disclosures. These are the disclosures for the planning committee and content peer reviewers. These are the disclosures for unlabeled use and a disclaimer that you can read. Please visit us at peerview.com forward slash BTK live 21 where you can download the slides and practice aids as well as apply for CME credit. Okay, so here's today's agenda. Number one, we're gonna provide a profile of BTK inhibitor options for B-cell cancer, uh, as well as uh, address the clinical problem of both resistance and intolerance uh, to these drugs. And then we'll have a case-based discussion on managing patients with CLL and mantle cell lymphoma who progress with resistance mutations or who are unable to tolerate a BTK inhibitor. So first we'll start with the current landscape, uh, including the BTK inhibitor FDA approvals and current status in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, spanning the diseases of CLL, MCL, MZL, and Waldenstrom uh, macroglobulinemia, where you can see ibrutinib is approved for all of those diagnoses. Acala brutinib is approved for CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. Zanubrutinib has an approval uh, in mantle cell only at this time and pirtabrutinib, a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, is being studied, but is not yet FDA approved. This is a slide that provides information on use of BTK inhibitors and is really supported by a tremendous amount of evidence in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In the frontline setting, there are several trials cited here, including Resonate 2, where ibrutinib was superior to chlorambucil, the Illuminate trial, where obinutuzumab was added to ibrutinib, ECOG 1912, where ibrutinib rituximab was superior to FCR, and the Alliance trial, where ibrutinib with or without rituximab was superior to BR. In the relapse refractory setting, we have positive data for ibrutinib versus ofatumumab, a robust data set in deletion 17P patients with ibrutinib, and the Helios trial, where ibrutinib was able to be added to chemoimmunotherapy. Hecalibrutinib has had some exciting data, both in the frontline and relapse refractory settings, where it's been superior uh, to chlorambucil of inutuzumab in the frontline and better than BR or idelalisib rituximab in the relapse refractory setting. And we have emerging data for xanabrutinib in the frontline setting with the Sequoia trial, where we have superior progression free survival versus bendamustine rituximab. Let's start off by discussing what is the scope of the problem. How do resistance and intolerance challenge the efficacy of VTK inhibitors? This is an important slide because it really spells out the problem where both resistance and intolerance are limiting the use of covalent BTK inhibitors in CLL. These are data which demonstrate that um, both intolerance events and progression events, either CLL or Richter's transformation, are the most common reasons for discontinuation of these drugs. And you can see from data largely from the ibrutinib experience that in the frontline setting at five years follow-up, the discontinuation rate is 41%. In the relapse refractory setting, it's 54%. So nearly half of the patients are stopping ibrutinib uh, after five years of initial exposure. And in terms of resistance, there are several mechanisms of resistance that have been proposed, but the most common uh, mechanism of resistance in CLL at least are CIS481 mutations which occur and make the binding of the covalent inhibitors ineffective. And we'll talk more about that throughout the presentation. This is another uh, data set that was presented by Steve Coutre uh, from both frontline and relapse refractory setting. These are some of the earlier trials where you can see an overall discontinuation rate of 38%. So a common theme both from clinical trials and from the real world experience is that about half of patients are coming off of this drug at about five years. So it is a problem that does need to be addressed for most patients who are being treated uh, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. 
And in addition to the real, in addition to the clinical trial experience, there's real world evidence which also highlights the same problem. Most importantly, that um, dis that discontinuation due to adverse event is the most common reason patients are stopping ibrutinib in, in a real world setting, followed by progression of disease and also highlighting some of the toxicities which are being observed that are limiting the utility of these drugs, including atrial fibrillation, rash, arthralgias, infections, uh, so on and so forth. Patients are coming off of ibrutinib from this real-world data set relatively quickly. The median time to discontinuation was seven months. And again, I've listed there the most common AEs leading to discontinuation. And of course, I'm talking all about CLL, but I'm, I'm really curious, since we have Nirav here who has expertise in mantle cell lymphoma, could you cue in as well? Do we see similar uh, patterns as well? Yeah, Anthony, uh, that's a great uh, question, and, and actually it's very similar. Um, and perhaps a, a little bit different in the sense that, you know, ibrutinib is really used as a second-line agent um, in mantle cell lymphoma, and, and when people fail this drug, it's almost like falling off a cliff. Uh, so this was a retrospective review that looked at patients who got ibrutinib in relapse setting. And once they relapsed after ibrutinib, the median overall survival in this retrospective cohort was only 2.9 months. And it really goes to show that there's limited therapeutic options available at the time that this study was done uh, when patients failed ibrutinib. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that important data. Um, we're also going to talk about some other options, and there are several BTK inhibitors uh, that are in development that one could consider with differences in their specificity, their mechanism of action, and then the potential for off-target effects. The ones listed here are the irreversible or the covalent inhibitors, acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib are the alt alternative choices to ibrutinib, and then the reversible inhibitors that are in development, vecabrutinib, ARQ531, and pirtabrutinib, which was formerly loxo. And we also have to really touch on the, the, the point as to why specificity really matters. Um, and there are several off-target effects of ibrutinib uh, that could potentially lead to some of the most uh, common and serious toxicities that we see associated with that agent. Some of the off-targets that are hit by ibrutinib and to a lesser extent the other agents include tech where you can see uh, an increased risk for both cardiotoxicity and bleeding and EGFR, where you may see toxicities such as rash, uh, diarrhea, or even potentially arthralgias related to that off-target effect. And then here we have a profile for potential mechanisms of resistance. I've already touched on um, the CIS481 mutation as the most common cause uh, in CLL. I'll be curious during uh, Nirov's talk to hear a little bit more about the speculation about the mechanisms of resistance to the covalent uh, BTK inhibitors. But there's three general themes we could think about, either target modification, bypass pathway activation, which Nirov, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's sort of the, the major theme in, in mantle cell or changes to the microenvironment. Any, anything more to add about the potential mechanisms in, in mantle cell? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, unlike CLL where I feel that things have been really well defined mechanistically, um, as you've highlighted. It's a little bit more nebulous in mantle cell, and it seems to be multiple factors that contribute to resistance. Uh, whereas, you know, here in CLL, we know that the major driver um, is the change in the binding site uh, within the BTK, sort of making the you know irreversible inhibitors less effective. Okay, so in the next section, we'll talk about understanding BTK inhibitor resistance and intolerance in CLL and need for better therapeutic options. Okay, so we'll start by talking about a case, and, and Nirav, I would love to hear your thoughts here. Um, so this is a clinical consult, an older patient with CLL who's progressing on BTK inhibitor therapy. So this patient is Robert, age 70, has symptomatic CLL, has underlying hypertension and renal insufficiency, I'm assuming from the hypertension, creatinine of 2.1. Um, testing results include a deletion 11Q by fish, TP53 is intact, uh, and they have a mutation on notch one, their IGHV unmutated, and they're treated with ibrutinib monotherapy, which we should comment, all of the BTK inhibitors to date are developed as monotherapy, or developed as continuous therapies. Um, after three years of ibrutinib as a continuous therapy, the patient presents with progressive lymphadenopathy and night sweats. White blood cell count now is up to 32. So I guess the question that's posed here is, should we consider testing for resistance mutations at this point? 
and is there an optimal time point for mutational testing? Uh, this is definitely a controversial question to start with. Nirav, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to be on the controversial side here myself. Um, I, I don't routinely look for mutations. Uh, you know, while it's great to identify what the mutational profile is, and, and often we do it in the setting of a clinical trial, right now, you know, I'm not using that information necessarily to drive treatment decisions. Um, you know, this patient clearly has signs of progressive disease. We have a rising white count. We've got uh, progressive lymphadenopathy. And so, you know, I think this warrants a, a conversation with the patient and discussion of a change in treatment, uh, but I am not one to routinely uh, check resistance mutations, so I am curious what you're all doing uh, at Sloan Kettering. So, great, great question. I think we do check them, but, we, but they're, they're not super helpful in forming clinical decision making, so it's more for learning and educational purposes. It does help us to understand the potential mechanisms of resistance. But for clinical decision making, I completely agree with you. This patient has ibrutinib resistance regardless of what the mutational profile shows. It's clinical resistance, they have progression of disease, and at this point in time, we're not nuanced enough to make decisions based on the presence or absence of any particular mutation. Um, so there are a few centers that are checking mutations sequentially to try to understand the timing of the development of a BTK mutation, for example. and Clinic and the relationship to clinical progression. But in straightforward clinical practice 2021, this patient has ibrutinib resistance, they need another therapy, and that should be the focus of the, the clinical decision making for this particular consult. Um, and of course, now I'm going to give the additional information. So let's pretend they were here at, at, at MSK. We decided we were going to do testing, and we did find the most common mutation, which was a CIS41S mutation. So next steps here will be to con consider the evidence supporting therapies. I'm just curious, before we jump into the, the data, what would you do at this point, Nirav, in terms of uh, next treatment? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, this is the most common mutation. And, you know, while, you know, people call acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib second generation, I think one thing that I'd like to highlight is that this mutation, uh, the way I understand it, is sort of across all the irreversible BTK inhibitors. And so uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider ACAL, abrutinib, or xanabrutinib actually as an option right now. And so I'd be looking to actually switch class or consider a drug on a clinical trial. Um, and most commonly, I think BCL2 inhibitors is where I would move next in a patient who was not a candidate for a clinical trial like this one who does have some degree of renal insufficiency. 100% agree with you. Let's take a look at the data. So what we know about ibrutinib resistance in CLL, um, Acquired resistance to ibrutinib occurs by mutations in BTK at the CIS481 site. That changes ibrutinib from a reversible inhibitor, which you, you just mentioned, um, or changes ibrutinib rather to a reversible inhibitor from an irreversible inhibitor with decreased binding efficiency and increases the BTK enzymatic activity. So that's kind of the most common situation. Uh, the drug just doesn't effectively bind anymore. You can also have downstream activating mutations in PLC gamma 2 at certain hotspots that are listed there, which promote a gain of function uh, in the setting of BCR activation. And then other rare mutations are listed here, like BRAF or CART11, which can also emerge. Um, for a useful reference on this uh, question of BTK resistance in, CL in CLL, please download the practice aid that we provided, which will really summarize this in more detail. These are also interesting data that have been uh, produced at the NCI and also um, the Ohio State, where there's essentially this lead time that occurs. Uh, first of all, the, the major headline from this data was that the most common reasons for um, resistance in CLL are either BTK, and hip, BTK uh, mutations, which is like number one through 10, followed by PLC uh, gamma two mutations. But then the other thing that's interesting is that the mutations can occur anywhere between like six and 12 months before you see clinical progression. And so you do have the potential for this lead time of detecting mutations and, and start to plan ahead in terms of what you might do. I think in a world where people are thinking about cellular therapies or stem cell transplantation, this type of information might be useful to know six or 12 months in advance to start planning ahead. But it's certainly not clinical practice at this time point. And that, correct me if I'm wrong, Nirav, you would agree not checking mutations sequentially on patients who are not progressing, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a challenging thing to do, and, and there's issues of cost, and, and, you know, it's great to do a test if we know what to do with the result. And so with that lead time, you know, I don't think we have enough data, and I hope, you know, to generate that data, 
with you and other colleagues in the future to say, hey, you know, we've identified this mutation early and that means we can do X, Y, and Z. Um, I just don't think we know what the next step is if we do find such a mutation early. I, I completely agree. And then just to highlight the case that this is not really specific to ibrutinib, but this is all of the covalent inhibitors. These are data presented by Jen Woyak, over 100 patients, 47 months follow-up. And the most common um, mutation that led to ibrutinib, uh, rather a calibrutinib related resistance uh, was the BTK cis481 mutation seen in 69% of the ACALA progressors. There's also this BTK T474I gatekeeper mutation, which is also seen very rarely. But essentially, it's the same story with the more selective inhibitors, which is why, to Nirov's point earlier, that if you're ibrutinib resistant, you're not likely to benefit. I don't want to say not likely. You will not benefit from acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib. Um, and so certainly we need to think about alternative classes for these patients. So speaking of which, what are the strategies that we can use to combat BTK inhibitor resistance in CLL? Well, two choices would be use a completely different class of drug. I think there um, it's alluding to venetoclax or a BCL2 inhibitor, or use a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, which in my mind is also a, a different class of drug. But uh, certainly those are the, the major options that we have available with clinical data at this time. So use a different um, drug class. Again, those are mentioned here. Um, the other option that's listed are PI3K inhibitors. Um, venetoclax, and we'll see data in a later slide, I think is a very effective drug in ibrutinib resistant or refractory patients. They respond, there's a high overall response rate. You can see MRD, the, um, the responses appear durable. And there is some data from OSU again, which really demonstrated that you can even decrease the fraction or the, the var variable allele fraction of the BTK mutation with venetoclax. So it's an effective drug, it's FDA approved. We use it when we don't have a clinical trial option for those patients. There's also data for PI3K inhibitors in this patient population. I have to say it's not very promising, relatively low overall response rate for idelalisib and the responses aren't durable. There's probably some overlap in terms of the mechanisms of resistance between the PTK and PI3K inhibitors that render them less effective. So I don't really consider Idella a great option if I have venetoclax or the non-covalent inhibitors available in the context so of So Anthony, just, just, yeah. just ask a follow-up question. So, you know, given your experience in, in CLL, have you seen patients who get venetoclax and then are resensitized to covalent BTK inhibitors? No, I, I, I think there's been some theoretical data to support that practice, but um, I have not. If it, if it is, if I've seen it, it's like an N of one uh, where we've gone back to them. But I think if you have a resistance mutation, you're pretty much done with the class overall. Um, and I don't think Venn really does resensitize that. When the clone comes back, it comes back with the same the same um, mechanisms of resistance that render the, the covalent inhibitors ineffective. Just my opinion. Others might say something. Have you heard otherwise from others? No, I mean, I've heard, you know, everything I hear is anecdotal, right? You hear those stories of people who got ibrutinib and progressed and then get another covalent and, and have a response, but but they're anecdotes that ends of one, uh, like you said. So I, I agree with you 100%. Not a strategy I pursue, but uh, based on the data here, uh, I was just curious if you had any other experience than I did. No, and th this is the data from uh, presented from Jeff Jones. This was a study in relapsed refractory disease where Venn as a monotherapy was given in a continuous fashion, 91 patients who were either ibrutinib refractory or intolerant. You can see the overall response rate was 70% and the median progression-free survival was approximately 24 months. So again, high overall response rate, durable remissions were observed. Now let's talk about the non-covalent BTK inhibitors. This is something I'm very excited about. I know Nirav is very excited about. We've worked together on uh, one clinical trial so far that's, ha that's produced really uh, exciting results. So you can see the three drugs that have been in development, RKIL-531, Pyrtobrutinib, SNS-062. You can see the um, commonality between those, th those three drugs is at least in preclinical data and now clinical data, there is support for their activity in, in ibrutinib or BTK inhibitor resistant disease. I won't really spend any more time on the SNS062. It wasn't really active clinically, but I will mention the clinical data available for RQL and pyrtobrutinib. So this is a schematic of how the non-covalent inhibitors overcome resistance. This is really oversimplified, but essentially you can see where ibrutinib and the other um, covalent inhibitors bind. It requires a CIS481. Um, and the non-covalent inhibitors here is pyrtobrutinib, 
binding in a different location, not requiring CIS-481 um, in order for them to be efficacious. So very oversimplification of what's going on here, but you can get a sense of why ibrutinib, ZANU, and ACALA wouldn't work in CIS-481 mutant disease. Now we'll get to the data that I was alluding to earlier that Nirav and I are excited about. This is pirtabrutinib, which uh, was formerly known as LOXO305 and relapse refractory CLL. You can see here 121 patients. This is a heavily pretreated patient population, almost entirely exposed to BTK inhibitors with a large proportion of patients who came off of um, drugs like ibrutinib for progression of disease. Response rate was 62%. It actually got much better with time. Here you can see prior resistance was 67%, prior intolerance 52%, uh, and there was a proportion of patients who had a CIS-481 mutation as well. And it's all outlined on this waterfall plot. This is just interesting uh, that was included as part of the paper um, that we co-published. And you can see here that the mutant allele fraction, the CIS-41 mutant allele fraction did decrease with exposure to pirtabrutinib. So kind of a, a way of saying that the drug is appropriately hitting the target that we want it to be hitting. And this is a um, subgroup analysis that basically tell us across the board whether you were intolerant, resistant, exposed to a BTK inhibitor or venetoclax or even up to five different classes of drugs. We call those patients pentavalent failure. That's a new term, but it seems to be sticking. Um, that the drug pirtabrutinib was effective and not a major difference in overall response rate. Even here, you can see highlighting the CIS-481 mutational status didn't matter, nor did the reason for discontinuation. So this drug was active across the board in the patients who have the highest unmet needs in CLL. And then this is the data for RQ531, a much more limited data set, only nine patients presented here by Jen Woyak. But you can see eight of the nine patients who had a CIS-481 mutation did have more than a 50% reduction in lymphadenopathy. And so there was clinical activity demonstrated here uh, for this drug as well. So now we're going back to the clinical concept, consult, choosing uh, therapy again for Robert, 70-year-old patient. Uh, remember his comorbidities and his molecular genetic profile got uh, single agent ibrutinib and then progressed three years later with a CIS-481 mutation. So now that we've seen the evidence, which option should we consider for Robert? And I'll, I'll throw this up to Nirav. No other, um, no other covalent uh, BTK inhibitors are appropriate. I think he and I both agree with that one, right? Nothing to discuss. Yeah. Uh, so here's the choice, Nirav. I'm curious, again, throwing the controversy at you. Let's pretend we have both venetoclax and pirtabrutinib available um, for this patient. What, how do you make your decision at this point? You know, um, you know. Uh, so in, in, I guess, assuming that pirtabrutinib is one day approved, right, in that setting, um, you know, and I, the safety profile of that drug, at least in my experience on clinical trial, has been quite favorable. The only thing I'd worry about venetoclax in this patient is he does have an elevated creatinine, and, and we know about tumor lysis. Um, and that being a potential risk with BCL2 inhibitors. And so considering the comorbid conditions, I think pertinobrutinib, you know, in, in a world where it could be potentially approved or if it were available on a clinical trial, I actually think would be a really good option. Uh, what are your thoughts, Anthony? I agree with you. I also am, a, without having hard evidence to support it, more in favor of staying within the same target or same class before switching to another class. And so for, to me, it makes more sense to have a strategy where I'm going from BTK to BTK because there's still potential for um, response hitting that target and then switching to the BCL2 inhibitor later. It's more, I would say, philosophical at this point than evidence-driven, but that's um, in addition to what uh, everything you said, which I agree with, um, part of the rationale why, for the same reason, um, if pirtabrutinib weren't an option and this were an intolerance question, I might also think about going from ibrutinib to acalabrutinib before switching to venetoclax. Um, so now let's switch over and talk about intolerance. So same patient, same comorbidity, same genetic profile. This time he's on ibrutinib responding well, but then develops AFib um, after four months. Um, and that AFib is recurrent despite two dose interruptions of ibrutinib and a resumption at a lower dose, let's say down to 280. And this, there's no evidence of BTK inhibitor resistance. And so questions here are, should we continue ibrutinib and just manage the AFib with cardiology or cardio-oncology or consider switching um, to another agent? Um, what do you think? 
You know, I think that we are lucky that we're now living in an era where we have agents to switch to. You know, when Ibrutinib first came out, I remember telling patients to push through, right? You know, we got to deal with the AFib because the drug was worth taking. Uh, these new drugs, you know, are far more selective and, and potentially could limit the risk of atrial fibrillation. So uh, I have been switching patients like this to these alternative agents because it's clear they're responding. There's no resistance mutation. And, um, you know, I think the data would suggest that AFib rates are lower in these more selective covalent inhibitors. I agree with you. I think um, the one thing I would add is that there's not tremendous amount of data available to say to patients that absolutely the risk will be reduced. Like once you have AFib, switching from ibrutinib to acalabrutinib buys you anything in terms of like long-term risk for stroke or recurrence of AFib. I think it's reasonable to do, especially if the AFib is like grade one or grade two, but I also am always a little bit hesitant to say absolutely that you're changing the bleeding risk or changing the AFib risk once that event has actually happened. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the data for that. So this is an overview of the BTK inhibitor toxicities in CLL, the common toxicities. We've talked about AFib, arthralgia, which I very annoying to patients, infection risk, diarrhea, which I don't find to be a major toxicity, hypertension, which is a big one, and bleeding risk. And then additionally, skin changes, which I think many patients uh, do highlight, fatigue, which to me seems cumulative over time, cytopenias, and also rarely, thankfully, ventricular arrhythmias. So this is a summary of BTK inhibitor safety monitoring approaches. So um, you don't really give BTK inhibitors um, concomitantly with warfarin. So for me, that's a deal breaker. If they're on warfarin, I would not start ibrutinib, for example, or acala. For new onset AFib, consider um, non-warfarin anticoagulation and monitor, again, depending on their CHADS VAST score. Uh, for hypertension, manage it with antihypertensives appropriately. I would add to that, make sure that you're not picking an antihypertensive that has um, interaction with ibrutinib, for example. You don't want to have a SIP um, inhibitor, for example, some of the calcium channel blockers. Monitor and manage cardiac arrhythmia, AFib, and treat appropriately, and monitor patients for signs of bleeding. Um, that may be most noticeable just in their hemoglobin. In terms of headache, which are uniquely common to acalabrutinib, um, you really want to think about educating patients that these are generally mild. They um, are often responsive to caffeine and acetaminophen, and they resolve relatively quickly. I, I even tell patients one to two weeks or two to three weeks. It's usually quick. Uh, neutropenia can happen with any of these drugs, but xanabrutinib has been highlighted more recently, and so um, keep in mind you should keep an eye on the ANC. Growth factor works well and monitor for infections and secondary malignancies. And again, we have refer uh, resources that can be downloadable uh, on this particular topic. This has been uh, some of the more exciting data um, or more talked about data over the spring conferences. This is the um, Alpine trial and the Elevate uh, RR trial. The background was here uh, that the Elevate RR was a randomized trial of ibrutinib versus acala. Uh, non-blinded study in relapse refractory disease with a non-inferiority endpoint, trial medits endpoint, that acala was non-inferior to ibrutinib. That wasn't as exciting as looking at the uh, toxicity profile. And you can see here that there was a statistically significant difference for AFib events with acala versus ibrutinib, 9.4 versus 16%. And that data seemed to be even more exciting in patients who didn't have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation at the start of the study. And then not to be outdone, there was the Alpine trial, similar patient population in that it was relapse refractory, although the, the Elevate RR were just limited to DEL17P, DEL11Q patients. And the take home from this trial was with shorter follow-up period that any grade um, and grade three uh, AFib events were lower with xanabrutinib as compared to ibrutinib, supporting what we talked about earlier that these drugs are more selective inhibitors of uh, BTK. So Anthony, uh, did this data change your practice pattern in the relapse refractory setting? Um, it did not because I was already fairly impressed with a lot of the data presented um, for the ACALA registrational trials, both frontline and relapse refractory. So I was already using a lot of acalabrutinib. So it, you know, if this had come out three years ago, it might have impacted me at that moment. But it, but at this particular time, using a lot of the more selective inhibitors, it didn't really change what I was doing. How about how about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's like you said, it's nice having the confirmation of, of what we were all hypothesizing, right? That, that the selective inhibitors um, are making more of a difference. Uh, so it was nice to see the data, but I agree with you. 
um, I've sort of evolved a little bit uh, prior to that as well. And then these are, the next two slides I'm going to present are intolerance studies. This is a CALA in ibrutinib intolerance presented by Kerry Rogers. Active drug, 73% ORR, responses were durable. Um, but what people really care about is whether or not the same toxicities occurred with ACALA as did with ibrutinib. And I would highlight, recommend that you guys highlight this slide and, or download this slide and take a look at it in detail. But you can see here that the BTK inhibitor associated toxicities are spelled out uh, that occurred on ibrutinib as a reason for discontinuation. And then overall, there were a few of those events which recurred with acalabrutinib. And the same is true, a um, little bit of a different way of presenting it, but the same uh, is true for data presented with zanubrutinib after either ibrutinib or acalabrutinib intolerance, although I have to say it's mostly ibrutinib, uh, presented by Mazir Shadman telling the same story, active drug, um, few recurrences of the same toxicities, and when they did occur, they were largely not as severe. And then this is the data for pyrobrutinib or LOXO305, specifically in the subset of patients who are um, BTK inhibitor intolerant. And you can see, and those are the lighter blue bars, they are, um, uh, the overall response rate uh, to date was 52%. Okay, and these are the, uh, this is the AE profile for pyrobrutinib, uh, specifically highlighting the BTK-mediated toxicities, including bruising, rash, arthralgia, hemorrhage, hypertension, and AFib. The overwhelming theme here is that there are relatively limited, um, low proportion of patients, uh, less than 2% of patients had um, AFib or A-flutter, and then uh, hypertension was a rare event, as were bleeding events, and so on and so forth. So some of the more common BTK-associated toxicities with the covalent inhibitors weren't seen with pyrobrutinib uh, to the same extent, nor the same severity. So we're back to our clinical consult. Remember, uh, this is Robert, who was BTK inhibitor intolerant um, and had atrial fibrillation that was persistent, even though they tried to reduce the dose and hold the drug. Um, we talked about um, potential options, and those include um, continuing ibrutinib, although given the persistent AFib, um, probably not the best idea. We've talked about the potential for sequencing to a more specific um, inhibitor like Acala or Xanabrutinib. It's an option given the intolerance data presented um, by Kerry Rogers and um, Mazir Shadman, or thinking about a drug like um, Pyrtobrutinib, which is not FDA approved, but available in the context of the Bruin clinical trial, which did appear to be a very promising approach as well. So those are our options and those are the data to support. Um, this is a slide that I put together just to try to understand where non-covalent BTK inhibitor therapy will play a role in CLL. And this is not meant to be like looking into the future five years from now because there are several clinical trials that are very intriguing with the non-covalent inhibitors, particularly the pyrtobrutinib, which may move it up to an earlier line of therapy. But this is to say that if you have a patient on a BTK inhibitor today and this drug were approved, in the setting of progression, uh, we could think about either venetoclax-based therapy or a non-covalent uh, inhibitor as a very reasonable choice. In the setting of intolerance, certainly wait for the patient to progress, but you can think about an alternative BTK inhibitor or venetoclax, and in that category, I would, I would include a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. And a little bit outside of the scope of today's presentation, but certainly there are several patients with CLL who will be started with venetoclax-based therapy and this is a sequencing algorithm that looks at alternative therapies after um, either progression on therapy, progression after therapy, or an intolerance, where we can see that there is a, a prominent role for BTK inhibitor-based therapy uh, and, a, and, a, and a role for sequencing non-covalent BTK inhibitors in, both in the setting of progression of disease on covalent uh, BTK inhibitors or in the setting of BTK inhibitor uh, intolerance events. So these are some take-homes in terms of mapping sequential therapy with BTK inhibitor options in CLL. Okay, so if a patient with CLL progresses on a BTK inhibitor with or without a resistance mutation, our options that we've discussed in detail include venetoclax or a clinical trial with a non-covalent uh, inhibitor. I would argue uh, a PI3K inhibitor might work, but it's been less well studied in this particular situation. Or if the patient is unable to tolerate ibrutinib or another covalent BTK inhibitor, but is responding, potentially sequencing to an alternative kinase inhibitor like acalabrutinib, or thinking about the non-covalent uh, agents such as pyrtobrutinib, 
And I would add to this list also uh, venetoclax is a reasonable option in the setting of BTK inhibitor intolerance. Uh, please download the take-home points, which we've made available as practice aids, summarizing sequential strategies with BTK inhibitors. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, that's a great uh, review of CLL and, and, and the role of BTK inhibitors and future non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Um, so moving on to, to mantle cell, where BTK inhibitors also play a large role, uh, going to focus on planning for BTK resistance and intolerance in mantle cell and implications for therapy selection and sequencing. So I'm uh, going to start with a case here. So here we have um, a typical sort of mantle cell patient. Um, Helen, a 70-year-old woman, uh, has newly diagnosed mantle cell, presents with uh, symptoms, a lot of B symptoms, weight loss, splenomegaly, fatigue, uh, was found to have a high KI-67 and a blastoid variant, and uh, was treated uh, in the community with RCHOP chemotherapy, and was offered an autologous transplant, which is something we do consider frontline in mantle cell, to improve uh, the duration of remission and, and prolong uh, progression-free survival, uh, she declined that, and that's a reasonable consideration, you know, being a 70-year-old woman. And uh, she responds to therapy, but then has disease progression, which is detected about two years later. Uh, and we now have a PET-CT that shows relapse disease in the chest and abdomen. BTK inhibitors are a recommended second-line option, but the question is, how do we choose between them? So, uh, you know, there were three pivotal trials that looked at the varying BTK inhibitors that Anthony just covered, uh, specifically in relapsed refractory mantle cell. Uh, the first one was ibrutinib, which was the first BTK uh, developed, and it was FDA approved in November 2013. And when ibrutinib was studied, it was sort of a new class in mantle cell lymphoma. So when it was studied, it was studied in a slightly more refractory population. The median lines of prior therapy were three. The median age of the patients was 68 years. And the overall response rate was 68%, and the CR rate was 21%, with the median duration of response of 17 months and a median progression-free survival of about 14 months. You can see here that the major adverse events were very similar to what Anthony discussed in CLL, with uh, neutropenia being a major side effect, a hemorrhage and bleeding, a common uh, finding with BTK inhibitors, and atrial fibrillation. Then came the sort of second generation or, or more selective covalent BTK inhibitors. And so they did similar studies in relapsed refractory uh, mantle cell lymphoma uh, with acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, and you'll see certain differences uh, in this trial. At this time, BTK inhibitors have now become more standard to be a second-line therapy, and so the median lines of prior treatment had been two versus three for the other studies. You can see that the age of the patients was similar. You see a slightly higher overall response rate, but again, that might be partially related to having one less line of therapy. Um, and you can see here a median duration of response of sort of 13 months for acalabrutinib and, and 19 and a half months for xanabrutinib, and median progression-free survival, the 12-month rate being 67% for acalabrutinib and 22 months for, for xanabrutinib. Now, again, it's difficult to compare these across studies because of heterogeneity in patient population, um, but we did see sort of discontinuation in 6% and 9% similarly. Now, what as Anthony did discuss, you know, there are different rates of different complications. Um, and so you see, you know, neutropenia uh, being different uh, with these newer products and specifically less bleeding and atrial fibrillation uh, with the second generation uh, inhibitors. So, Anthony, what are your thoughts for this patient? I'll tell you, um, I think outside of a, a randomized clinical trial, I think that they're all very reasonable options, to be honest with you. I think that there's enough heterogeneity in the patient population studied that to me, it's really hard to weigh in with absolute certainty um, whether there's one drug that's better than the others at this point, at least in this population. Yeah, I agree with you. And, I, I, and that's exactly what I want to get to is that some of the selection that we do has to be considered, taken into consideration what are the patient-specific needs. And so we know that these different drugs have potentially different uh, side effects and in different medications you can take concurrently. So, you know, hypertension, you know, the degree of baseline hypertension, and we know that BTK inhibitors can contribute to that, um, is an important consideration. The good news is, is that BTK inhibitors tend to be effective in mantle cell even in those who have a p53 mutation and that's similar to what we see in the CLL uh, world as well but an important consideration is you know is this a person who has severe reflux disease 
you know, there are interactions with acalabrutinib uh, where you might have to come off of a PPI. And so maybe not the best option in someone who has really bad reflux. Uh, if they have a history of atrial fibrillation or if they're an older patient with other risk factors for atrial fibrillation, you know, I think the, the data from the trials that I presented do show lower rates of atrial fibrillation with the second generation BTK inhibitors. Um, neutropenia, uh, which it tends to be a more of a problem in our mantle cell patients, often because they have had prior therapies, uh, drugs like bendamustine and drugs and treatments like autologous stem cell transplant, maybe something you need to take into account is what is their marrow reserve, um, especially for those patients who've had a prior stem cell transplant, which is still a common occurrence in those patients with mantle cell. And then lastly, dosing. You know, um, pay, you know mantle cell, like uh, other he hematological malignancies, does impact patients who are older. And so, you know, there might be a benefit to once daily dosing over a twice daily dosing strategy, again, depending on the patient and their compliance. And so I agree with Anthony that, you know, the data suggests that all three of these agents are appropriate and effective. And what I try to do is individualize the needs of my patient and try to choose the best BTK inhibitor in that situation. So let's go back to our case. So uh, Helen receives ibrutinib and, and responds. Uh, but Helen does ultimately uh, progress. And so, uh, you know, gets, you know, the RCHOP chemotherapy, gets ibrutinib, but unfortunately does have progressive disease after one year with uh, ibrutinib BTK inhibitor therapy. Um, and so what are the options uh, for post-BTK? Uh, you know, similar to what Anthony discussed in CLL, we can consider another agent class. We can consider non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And then we can also explore CAR T-cell therapy, which is FDA approved. Uh, so let's go through some of these options and then we'll have Anthony weigh in on what he would like to do. Uh, but before we do that, just to talk a little bit more about resistance um, to ibrutinib and MCL, um, as we discussed earlier, whereas the pathways in CLL are well defined um, and we know there's specific you know, mutations that occur in C481, it's far more complicated in mantle cell, and there's primary resistance is associated with cell cycle, ERB4 mutation, PIM mutations, SMARCA2 and 4 mutations, and many other mutations that activate NF-kappa B. Uh, secondary resistance to ibrutinib is also complicated, but it includes uncommon mutations in C481S, PLCY2, as well in CARD11. So there is a, a uh, reference here on BTK resistance in mantle cells, something you can take a look at uh, to get greater information about this topic, but again, not as clearly defined as it is in CLL uh, for patients who have mantle cell resistance. So uh, what are the options? So CAR-T, brexacaptogene autolucil, is an FDA-approved option for relapsed refractory mantle cell. Um, and the ZUMA-2 clinical trial actually enrolled patients very similar to our patient, Helen, uh, who got a BTK inhibitor and progressed. So all the patients on this trial did have prior BTK exposure. Uh, and you can see here that the overall response rate with this anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapy was incredibly high at 92%, with two-thirds of patients achieving a complete remission. Uh, however, the median duration and the median duration of response, progression-free survival, and overall survival were not reached with a median follow-up of 17 and a half months. Now, for those of you not familiar with CAR-T, while it is an effective therapy, it is not a therapy for all of our patients, and that's because there is a significant toxicity associated with it. And so you can see that here, that a common grade three or higher AEs occurred in form of cytopenias in almost all of the patients, and grade three or higher infections in a third of patients. In addition, a cytokine release syndrome, grade three and higher, occurred in 15% of patients in grade three or higher neurologic toxicity, which is quite severe, these patients are obtunded, occurred in 31% of patients. And there were two grade five infectious AEs that occurred. So while this is an effective therapy, I think we'd have to be very careful when thinking about our 70-year-old patient as to what is the best option uh, for this woman. So what are other options that we can consider in the post-BTK inhibitor space? So again, copying the algorithms in CLL, uh, venetoclax does have activity in this setting. So venetoclax, as we discussed, is a BCL2 inhibitor, and it's been studied across multiple hematological malignancies, even though CLL continues to be a major indication where it's used. There was a phase one study where they looked at relapsed refractory mantle cell, 
but I'll note that this was a population of patients that were BTK naive. And you can see here in the waterfall plot on the right that almost all of the patients had a meaningful response uh, and an overall response rate of 75% and a complete response rate of 21% with a median progression-free survival of 14 months. But the question doesn't necessarily apply to our patient who had prior BTK inhibitor. And so to look at those outcomes, there was a nice uh, retrospective review um, that was published by Toby Ear. And, and they looked specifically at patients who had progressed on a BTK inhibitor and then got venetoclax. And you can see here that the response rates did diminish. So uh, the overall response rate in this retrospective cohort was 53% with a CR rate of 18%. And what I would consider sort of a disappointing progression-free survival of only 3.2 months. Now again, these are small numbers of patients and we need larger prospective studies to better understand how effective venetoclax is after a BTK inhibitor in mantle cell, but it is a considered a second line or subsequent option in NCCN and definitely a consideration for somebody who may not be the best CAR T cell therapy candidate. What about non-covalent inhibitors? So, um, you know, I was lucky to participate in this trial with Anthony and, and very exciting partner Brudnib uh, was actually found to be highly active in, in, even among patients who had prior BTK therapy. So you can see here the waterfall plot and about even among the patients who had prior BTK therapy, the overall response rate was 52%. And many of these patients had a durable response uh, lasting many months, even though they had failed a prior BTK inhibitor. And you can see here in the waterfall plot that the dark blue are patients who had BTK discontinuation for progression, where the light blue had BTK discontinuation for toxicity, which was nearly all of the patients that were on this clinical trial. Notably, uh, this pertinibrutinib did demonstrate efficacy in other histologies, uh, other forms of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Waldenstrom's although a little bit beyond the scope of our conversation today. So uh, let's get back to Helen. So she's our 70-year-old patient, got our chop, did not want to do an autologous transplant, and then progressed and got ibrutinib and did well for a while, but now is progressing on ibrutinib monotherapy. Uh, so Anthony, what do you think? Uh, what are your thoughts about how we should, uh, what, we would, what would you consider for this patient? I mean, I think here, um, if I could get access to uh, pirtabrutinib, I would probably pursue a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. I think for this 70-year-old, it's not unreasonable to consider CAR as an option, although you're still probably going to need a bridge um, while you collect T-cells and manufacture the product. So those would be my two top options, either, I don't want to say a specific drug, but a clinical trial or CAR uh, per the FDA approval. Um, less excited about venetoclax here, which also is not approved, but I guess it's something you could think about as well. Yeah, you know, and, and I agree with you. And I, the only thing I would add to this conversation is, you know, thinking about this patient, you know, she declined an autologous transplant, you know, when she was younger. And, and now she's, you know, older and, and, you know, going through CAR T-cell therapy to me to a certain degree is just as involved in a, as an autologous stem cell transplant. There's an apheresis procedure. Uh, there's lymphodepletion instead of conditioning chemotherapy. And so, you know, I, I actually would favor one of the oral agents. You know, as Anthony mentioned, neither one of these are technically approved, um, you know, for mantle cell lymphoma in particular, although you are often able to get off-label use with venetoclax. Um, but, you know, if we had a clinical trial, I think I would favor pertinibrutinib, especially seeing, you know, the high overall response rate specifically in a patient population that had prior exposure to uh, a covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, so what if Helen had been unable to tolerate BTK inhibitor? So this is a little bit different setting um, where, you know, she had difficulty, uh, you know, with bleeding and arthralgia within the first year of treatment. Uh, what do you think, Anthony? What would you do in this setting? I think in BTK inhibitor intolerance, I think, is the same story um, clinically in CLL and MCL. So I think if as long as the toxicity was not really, really concerning, and I guess it depends on the individual toxicity, switching to an alternative BTK inhibitor would be a very reasonable thing to think about. Yeah, and, you know, and I agree with you. And, and just to add to Anthony, a lot of the algorithms actually we've studied in BTK inhibitors really just comes from the CLL data just because that data set happens to be very robust. Uh, with a larger population of patients getting BTK inhibitors, often getting it frontline, you know, there's just a lot more patients who have been exposed to BTK inhibitors with CLL 
And so we've used those algorithms in CLL to help us make decisions in mantle cells. And so um, we can consider switching agents if we felt that uh, that was an indication. But, but my preference would be that if we're having a BTK inhibitor related toxicity, then I would consider a different, more selective BTK inhibitor that would be potentially more appropriate uh, for the patient. Um, or we could consider a non-covalent agent like pertrobrutinib if it were available on a clinical trial um, or in a situation, you know, in a hypothetical situation where such a drug was approved um, and available as well. Um, I would note that the differences in CLL, you know, in the current era is that frontline therapy for mantle cell is still chemoimmunotherapy. Um, and I'm sure Anthony would agree that frontline therapy for CLL is no longer chemoimmunotherapy. And so there are differences um, in our patients when they get to these BTK inhibitors. Uh, what are your thoughts, Anthony? I totally agree with everything you said. Um, mantle cell is a different landscape. And I think that the algorithm of, again, making this switch um, to, a non, to a, an alternative, more selective agent probably makes the most sense. But you've, you've spelled out there nicely what the other choices might be in this situation. So um, to take home from here, uh, where are we with BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma? Um, so in my opinion, you know, it is a second line therapy at this time point. So if you progress after frontline therapy, uh, whatever that may be, a bendamustine based therapy or CHOP, uh, whether or not you get an autologous transplant, if you relapse, most of us are going to BTK inhibitors. And the good news is, is we have three really good drugs that are quite efficacious in this, uh, in this patient population. Um, that are overall very well tolerated. And what I like to do is choose the appropriate agent based on the comorbidities of the patient, what are the concomitant medications they're taking, and what may be the best schedule uh, for that patient. Now, for those patients who do progress on BTK inhibitors, I do think that CAR T cell therapy is a very appropriate option uh, for those who are eligible, you know, so our younger, healthier patients. Um, that we think can tolerate the toxicities of CAR-T and, and that CAR-T would be within um, their goals of care to, to try and get a high intensity treatment like that uh, in the post-BTK space. Uh, for patients who are older or infirm or not able to tolerate something like CAR-T, uh, you know, I think venetoclax is a reasonable option. Again, that would be off-label use of venetoclax or hopefully non-covalent BTK inhibitors will become available um, to the public, and until then, consider using those in the setting of a clinical trial. For those patients who are intolerant to ibrutinib, um, I, I really feel that the algorithms that, that Anthony spelled out uh, very well highlight the options here, and I would consider a different covalent BTK inhibitor, either acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, uh, whichever I felt was most appropriate uh, for that patient. Uh, and again, you know, we do have these take-home points that are downloadable. Um, as a practice aid in talking about sequential strategies for BTK inhibitors uh, that you can obtain after this talk. Nirav, thanks so much. That was a great presentation on mantle cell. I learned a lot. Um, and certainly, you were great about um, not only highlighting what the, um, the important um, unmet needs are, but also um, presenting some really intriguing data that may actually help patients in the future. Um, for both of um, our diseases, we also want to talk about the future, and that's a good segue into the next uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, moving forward, talking about important next steps with BTK inhibitor therapy and uh, B-cell cancers. Um, so I'm going to do the CLL part, and then maybe um, would you mind doing the mantle cell part? Of course. In CLL, there's a lot of interesting um, combinations and trials that are ongoing or have been recently reported. I'll just highlight a couple of them here. Uh, so there's the phase three GLOW trial, and that trial is interesting because it looks at the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax uh, as compared to the chlorambucil abinutuzumab, and there is an improvement in progression-free survival versus that comparison. So this may become a new option in the frontline setting. Uh, there's the Sequoia trial, which uh, I mentioned earlier, primary endpoint was met. We're waiting for further up, um, updates on several endpoints, and this is a trial looking at xanabrutinib in many settings. Then there's the Bruin 321 trial, which is uh, a really intriguing trial because it, now we're looking at peer to brutinib as compared to standard of cares in the third line setting, Idella R or bendamustine rituximab. So uh, a registrational trial for that molecule. And then there's the 322 trial, the Bruin 322, which is another phase three trial. Here we're challenging the Murano regimen with Peter Brutinib. It's Venar plus or minus um, Peter Brutinib. 
and this is probably in an earlier relapse refractory setting in CLL. So the, the Bruin trial has led to these um, randomized phase three trials, which are, are really challenging clinically relevant standards of care. And then um, we've also presented data with Pierdo uh, in Richter transformation. These are relapse refractory Richters, um, promising overall response rate, and we'll see more data uh, in the future on this particular molecule in Richter transformation. So lots of exciting trials in CLL. This is just a small snippet of what's going on. Uh, I'm really curious to hear about what's going on in mantle cell. Yeah, a lot of similar themes. You know, I think we uh, steal a lot of ideas from, from the CLL. Uh, That's not true. Here. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, one thing I didn't talk about today was actually combination therapy. So there was really exciting and early data looking at the combination of a BTK and BCL2 inhibitor uh, in relapse refractory mantle cell published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, a couple years ago now. And it showed sort of high rates of uh, minimal residual disease negativity. And that sort of became the premise for this very large trial called Sympatico, looking at this combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax versus ibrutinib alone. Uh, and in order to see if that combination does actually lead to better outcomes, and I think something we're all excited to see results from. Uh, similarly, you know, more combination stuff is using these BTK inhibitors frontline. Um, so we still do use chemoimmunotherapy as the backbone as fr for frontline mantle cell lymphoma. Um, so there's various studies sort of testing a covalent BTK inhibitor in combination uh, with regimens like bendamustine and rituximab for newly diagnosed disease. And then for our older patients where chemoimmunotherapy is not necessarily a great option, um, there are studies looking at rituximab with ibrutinib and comparing that uh, specifically in elderly population to those getting uh, rituxan and chemotherapy. Um, and so again, would be a good option if we see good efficacy there as a frontline option for those people who are not great chemotherapy candidates. And a study that I'm very excited at, uh, to uh, actually participate in as well is uh, the Bruin MCL study, which is actually going head to head um, uh, with pertrobrutinib against the approved BTK inhibitors. So, so we're going to have a head to head study of a non covalent BTK versus dealer's choice of the, the three covalent BTK inhibitors we saw. And so I think this will be a very exciting study. Um, which will really help define, you know, what are the toxicity differences between non-covalent and covalent BTK inhibitors, and is there a difference in efficacy, uh, you know, going against the non-covalent. So I think lots of excitement uh, here. Um, combinations are the theme, and, and I'm excited to see what a head-to-head -head study will look like uh, with pertrobrutinib. Well, uh, it looks like the audience has been uh, taking in everything that we said, and there are many, many um, questions that have been posed that I think we can try to address some of them now. Um, let's take a look at the first question that was posed. Now that second generation agents are approved in CLL and MCL, can we use a Cala or Xanu in patients experiencing either ibrutinib intolerance or resistance? Uh, do you want to tackle that one for both CLL and MCL, Nira? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think that the data that you discussed um, and, and similarly in mantle cell and, and just the mechanism, you know, all three of these um, irreversible covalent inhibitors mechanistically work the same way. And so when there is resistance, I am a believer, um, and I think the data we've shown today also suggests that the resistance is across all three of these agents. And so um, and when it comes to ibrutinib resistance, um, I don't really favor using ACAL or xanabrutinib. Now, in the world of intolerance, I think this is exactly why these drugs were developed, is they are more selective, they are potentially uh, have different toxicity profiles, and I think they should be absolutely considered uh, in the setting of ibrutinib responders where intolerance is an issue. I agree. Uh, next question, what do you do when a patient fails ibrutinib and venetoclax in CLL? I guess I could tackle that one. You should tackle that one, Anthony. That's a tough one because I think it's, you have to, there, you need to spend some time defining what failure means because if it's an intolerant event, for example, to either agent, I think it's worthwhile to consider either retreatment um, with better supportive care or switching to a more selective BTK inhibitor. If you're a double resistant patient, that's a bigger problem because I, I really don't think that there is a standard of care approved agent with proven efficacy in the double novel agent failure uh, treated patient population, which is where clinical trials like Bruin have come in very handy in my practice for uh, treating patients. So I think you're, the questioner is defining an important unmet need. 
this is where the non-covalence, the bispecifics, the CAR T, you name the class are being studied right now to try to help define what the, you know, the third line novel agent uh, standard of care should be. Um, next question, how early should we consider using non-covalent agents once they're available in CLL or MCL? Uh, Nirav, do you want to tackle that one? Where, where would you place them um, assuming the Bruin, current Bruin trial led to an approval tomorrow? Yeah, so I mean, I think that we have to follow the data. And so in the current Bruin trial, uh, the patients who got pertrobrutinib were generally all exposed to other covalent BTK inhibitors. And so that was uh, either that they were uh, resistant to a prior BTK inhibitor or intolerant. Um, and I think the data will drive where they will land. So, so BTK inhibitors are definitely second line in mantle cell lymphoma. But the Bruin trial is going to, the upcoming Bruin trial is a head to head study of a covalent. BTK inhibitor against a non-covalent inhibitor. And so I think that data will drive that decision-making and potentially place a drug like pertubrutinib um, in front of the covalent inhibitors if the toxicity and efficacy profile is better than what we have with the current covalent. What about CLL, Anthony? What are your thoughts? General, same answer. I think based on the current data set, I don't think you could justify putting them before the covalent BTK inhibitors. But again, the clinical trials may change the way we are, you know, future clinical trials may change that. Certainly, I don't think it's ma there's a mandate that you should have to get venetoclax before you got a covalent inhibitor. There were patients who went from BTK to, to, to pirtabrutinib before they went on to venetoclax later. So I think it's, there's some more choices in CLL, but uh, certainly um, probably not as first therapy, but definitely not as first therapy and probably not before a covalent inhibitor based on the current data. Okay, next question. Would you consider a non-covalent BTKI before a PI3K inhibitor in patients progressing on a BTK inhibitor? I could take this uh, last question. Uh, yes, if um, non-covalents were approved, I think we have enough data from the Bruins trial, for example, to support their activity. Um, one thing I'll highlight about the current approved PI3K inhibitors is they were not studied in novel agent failure uh, patients. Patients treated with on the original Idella rituxan study no one received a brutinib or um, venetoclax, and the, and the DUO trial, there was like almost zero patients who had a prior BTK inhibitor. So we really don't know the activity of these drugs in BTK inhibitor failures. Real-world data suggests that they're, they're not very active and, the, re, and the, the remissions are not very durable. So uh, we'd like to wrap things up. Uh, please remember to complete and submit your post-test and evaluation for CME credit. Um, if you feel like you missed anything, please uh, visit us at peerview.com forward slash BTK Live 21. Download the slide, download the practice aids, watch for a future on-demand version of the symposia, and join the conversation on Twitter at Peerview. And I want to thank everyone on behalf of myself and Dr. Shaw for participating, and we wish you a good evening. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony, and, and thanks for this great conversation today. Thank you.